And so we moved to Maryland when I was nine years old for two years. And because my father was going to be, uh, you know, and was, Assistant Secretary of Defense. And we never left, but we moved to Maple Avenue. And so that's where I, uh, I you know, grew up, went to Chevy Chase Elementary. And back in the days where kids walked to their school. I was there when they went through the whole busing thing to Rosemary Hills, which is another school. And we didn't know anything. We were just young kids. And the parents were the ones protesting. And we were like, what are they protesting? What's this mean? What, what are, and it was just a, what does this all mean for us, you know? Yeah. I was at Chevy Chase, and it was very sort of high-end white students. And my parents pulled me out and told me I was going to Sidwell Friends. And I thought, wait, I'm going to uh, that weird school. And, I'm, and by the way, I'm staying back in sixth grade. And I cried and cried and cried. It was one of the best things that ever happened to me. It was really the, the diversity at Sidwell Friends at that time in the 70s um, was overwhelming. Well, it's funny, I, I went to my 25th anniversary at Yale and I was the only person of the 1,200 some odd students in my entire class that was in elected office, which is somewhat shocking since there's so many presidents that come from Yale and all these other politicians. But I, I, I was there in the 80s and it was a time where people, like some of my opponents in this election, went and they thought, okay, I'm going to go to Wall Street and make a ton of money. And I, it was just never attractive to me. And I think the influence there was my mother was a teacher. My father, as I mentioned, um, was in, in government. It be, ultimately became undersecretary of defense of the United States. And I, in high school, I would go down after school and intern on Capitol Hill, first for Birch Bayh, who ultimately lived here, and then Bill Bradley. And then when I went to Yale, I uh, ran Gary Hart's campaign on campus. When I went to law school, I kind of, you know, I'm a, sort of a bleeding heart liberal as a young man. And if you never, if you're like what they say, if you're not a liberal at that point, you're never going to be. Um, so I thought I was gonna be a public defender because I, you know, sort of what, what, and I carried this with me when I became a prosecutor. The number one priority of a prosecutor is never to convict somebody who's innocent. And, and didn't commit the crime. And so I carried that with me, but I, I transformed during law school to the recognition that the power rests with the prosecutor. So if the prosecutor is a just, sound, morally and ethically um, righteous person, they're gonna make sure they're never prosecuting an innocent person. And that they have the power to determine who should be prosecuted for what and what should you know recommend it, what the sentence should be. I've always thought of the power of government uh, as something um, that should be you know admired and looked uh, looked favorably upon, and the, the and people in government can make people's lives better. And that was has always been the attraction to me. And as I sit here right now, I did 23 years in government, and while I've been doing some great things since leaving government, including representing states and lawsuits against fossil fuel companies and you know, on climate change and being on the board of you know, Year Up and being on the board of, of College Track and, and working on my own inner city lacrosse league I started up in Baltimore. Um, I'm doing fine, but I just, my, what I, my passion, my currency, what's in my DNA is helping people. And during COVID when we all were sort of reflecting upon who we are and what we are, where are we in our station in life and where do we want to go to, I realized I love being in public service. I was a prosecutor for 22 years um, as an assistant United States attorney, mostly in homicides, but did all kinds of other cases, and then state's attorney in Montgomery County, and then attorney general. And you know, I worked here with the state's attorneys, and Scott Patterson lives down the street here and has endorsed us for, for my candidacy, and so have all the, most of the other Democratic state's attorneys around the state. Not because only because I'm tough on the actual violent criminals, but also because of my record of being a fair prosecutor and being so far ahead on criminal justice issues, in terms of putting every police shooting in front of the grand jury, in terms of being the head of the NAACP Criminal Justice Committee in Montgomery County back in 1989 before I had children, and really working on some of these issues to make sure the system is fair. And so, yeah, I, 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 part of that was what I got in law school as well. People talk about you know, being spearheading the marriage equality effort in Maryland and all the environmental work I did, which I embraced, and, and, the, and the criminal issues and putting all the, you know, the Beltway snipers and 
Haddon Clark and all, you know, all, a, a litany of people behind bars, but it's the people that you, you sort of can help behind the scenes, the individuals that really need uh, somebody to, to, to get things done for them that, that's right. And they're, they're up against this sort of powerful government. How do you help that person? Well, I'm not running against Governor Hogan, and, and I think he's done a good job on a lot of, in a lot of different areas. Um, but what you often hear is he's done a really good job for a Republican. And I think it's that last phrase, the for a Republican, that, that, that gets me, because we ought to be doing things for a Democrat and for Democrats and for all people in Maryland, whether they're Republican, Independent, or Democrat. I mean, I'm seen as very practical, very middle of the road, very pro-business, very small, pro-small business. I'm the only candidate that actually in the race that actually gets all over the state other than my primary opponent um, and, and has Democratic values and a record of Democratic values and supports Democratic candidates. So um, I think Governor Hogan's popularity is, uh, off, is, is largely predicated on this idea that he's very open, sincere, doesn't come across as sort of over-consultant um, based. And, and I, I believe I have that attribute too, for better or for worse, you know, I'll speak my mind. Um, so I think those things are, are good. Focus. The lack of focus on Baltimore City is actually, even though I'm not from Baltimore City, we're not talking Baltimore City, we're paying for Baltimore City, and, and it's, it's the biggest city in our state. The complete lack of focus there, which has led to this, I, this, this city where people are afraid to go because they're gonna, at, at a red light, they're gonna get carjacked. Um, he hasn't really focused on the criminal, the, the crime issue. I have 22 years as a prosecutor, federal, state, local. So I think that's a big disting, distinguishing factor with, with that. I think, and, and, and his sort of lack of focus on climate change. I mean, in other words, he hasn't sort of done, he hasn't exasperated the problem in particular in terms of the climate and in, on our environment and the Chesapeake Bay. But, you know, the Chesapeake Bay and, and the environment, it was, it was my biggest issue when I was attorney general. We left the bay in, in, in vastly improving shape and we've, we've sort of gone back there. And then the final thing is I think is sort of the, I'm a big anti-Donald Trump person. I think he's mentally ill. I think he's a narcissistic dictator, wannabe, dumb person. And really degraded the office of the presidency. And while Governor Hogan pushed back a little bit lately against uh, President Trump, I, I don't think he did it enough. And he should have done it more and he should have protected our state and our country from Donald Trump more than he did. Well, my over two decades of experience in government, local, state, and federal, makes me uniquely qualified for the job. I mean, I'm running, I mean, Rashawn Baker, who is the former county executive of Prince George's County, is also qualified for the job. Everybody else is somewhat limited in their background. They've done great things in their chosen professions, but actually running state government is not one of those things that they've done. And so I did get involved in policy decisions from top to bottom. I also think that my experience in government is not just sort of valuable in unto itself, you sort of sat around for a long time. I think the record that we accomplished and the areas which we chose to focus on are important, but also it, it's understanding how the levers of government work. I'll give you an example. Uh, when we had the Beltway snipers, if you remember that, that case, and people were getting shot and everyone was scared around the community. Um, yes, it was a, a legal deal. I ran the Joint Sniper Task Force, but it was understanding the levers of government to be able to work with the federal, local, and state agencies to put everyone together, to have them work together, to apprehend those men within 22 days. Mm -hmm. And then subsequently to go to Annapolis and get legislation passed that would help and make our state safer. Mm -hmm. so we clearly need to be more imaginative and innovative on how we police in this country and in this state. I'm the only person running for governor who has a scintilla a back, a, 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 at all, a background in criminal justice. And I sort of navigated and approached it from both sides for a very long time. I was the head of the NAACP Criminal Justice Committee in Montgomery County starting 1989. When I became state's attorney, we started the first drug courts in Maryland's history to take people away that have drug addictions, instead of putting them in cages and paying 30 something grand a year to keep them in that cage, to make them productive citizens. And, and, and drug courts really work. And when I'm governor, we're gonna have a drug court in every jurisdiction in the state, or, the state's, or that jurisdiction's not gonna get funded by the state. 
domestic violence courts. I started the first domestic violence courts in the state's history, really important for vic victims of domestic violence. We started the Family Justice Center in, in Rockville, which we're gonna have the regional family justice centers all throughout the state because they flat out work and help families in need of assistance. So I think, and, and, and every police shooting, every time a police officer shot, his or her weapon, I would put it in the grand jury. I wouldn't whitewash the case. I let the citizens of, of, of the community determine whether that was a justified shooting. And finally, I fully implemented community prosecution, and I was the first office to do that in the country. And that is prosecuting, having prosecutors by neighborhood instead of by crime. So you can imagine each county, in each county, each city, in each area, has their own prosecutors working with their own police to, to know who's supposed to be there, who's not supposed to be there, who are the good people, who are the bad people, and who are the good police officers, and who are the, the are not so good police officers. So I think sort of recognizing reform and doing things going forward, like requiring every police officer to have two years of higher education, hopefully an associate's degree in public safety where they learn cultural training, diversity training, and these issues, learning how to become a police officer instead of giving an 18-year-old a badge and a gun and say, have at it. Um, those kind of ideas, I think, going forward are, are important. That said, I've been with mothers kneeling down on the sidewalk when they're watching their only son pass. I, I mean, I was a homicide prosecutor in Washington, D.C. for three and a half years. My, my docket of homicides was bigger than the 1.1 million person county I lived in, in Montgomery County and homicides when I became state's attorneys. I fight violent criminals. They ought to be in jail. If you're a convicted felon and you're walking around with a gun, you should be in jail. So I, I, I think I made that balance pretty well. And, and we, I prosecuted carjackers, sex abusers. I argued in front of the Supreme Court of the United States. We won nine to nothing to keep a, a, child, a sex abuser in jail. So, so I think that, that's sort of what people are looking for. Crime is a huge issue right now in Maryland for the reasons you said. And, and, and there's sort of a backlash against law enforcement. And, and I think things like community prosecution bridge law enforcement with the communities they serve and build that trust that's necessary. And, and you know, I started, I worked with the Cal Ripken Foundation and something called Badges for Baseball and brought that to Maryland where we had law enforcement working with underserved communities playing baseball, but get, making sure those initial uh, connections were positive ones. And I did the same thing when I started Charm City Youth Lacrosse up in Baltimore. We had five or 600 kids in that and brought law enforcement to, to there as well. So the, the first contact a, a young person has can be a positive one. I think that is important. Um, the, there are some small projects I'm interested in on day one, it, it's a, the proverbial day one, one of which is to help convert the two billion pounds of chicken manure that goes into the Chesapeake Bay each year into a clean power source on the eastern shore to help protect agriculture and the poultry industry and, and also protect the environment at the same time. I've always thought that's a, a false choice between agriculture and the environment, and I want to. And that's a project I've been contemplating working on for ten years. So I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to working to immediately eradicate crime throughout the state. And and as somebody who's has has, has been a prosecutor at the state, federal, and local level, to be able to take those tools and that arsenal. And, and make and actually look at crime issues from both perspectives, making sure we're doing it in a just and fair way, but to get criminals off the street. Um, those are those are sort of the, the initial things I'm looking at, and then broader things are, are are legalizing cannabis to help pay for some of this. Though we have an enormous surplus now, which is a great thing to do that we have. Really focus on climate change, the environment, solar energy, offshore wind, off Ocean City, um, getting the infrastructure for the electric vehicles that are coming. And you know, if you walk out the house, there's no charging stations, and and yet the private sector is literally and figuratively driving us toward this, this electric vehicles um, world, which is a great thing, and, and then women, protecting women's reproductive rights. So the Supreme Court's decision will come out later this spring. It's going to either overturn Roe v. Wade or scale it back, and I think we need to have somebody who understands government and the power of government to help protect women's reproductive rights. So I think that's going to be a, a, something I have to work on right away. And then in the long term, also universal pre-K and universal child care. So there's a lot, there's a lot to do. I have a lot of energy. I'm excited about it. I've done it before, so we'll know I'll do it again. And, and that's, so I'm looking forward to day one.